Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling, Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the Program Manager for the Market Center and I will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero, the National Recycling Coalition for providing technical support. Today's webinar focuses on zero waste programs for corporations, environmental claims, and verification. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites via YouTube links. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Tad Brzezinski. Tad has over 30 years of a diversified experience and provides sustainable manufacturing, building and operations, green marketing and training and education consulting services. Tad is recognized as a leader in the industry and teaches and speaks extensively on sustainable development and sustainable manufacturing. Tad served as the Waste Minimization Program National Expert for the Environmental Protection Agency from 1997 to 2007. He received numerous awards from the EPA, including two national notable achievement awards and a Superior Service Medal for outstanding collaboration with industry, which resulted, which reduced 100 million pounds of waste and saved 1.6 billion gallons of water and saved the industry $42 million. He integrated EPA reinvention programs, also known as Project XL, Common Sense Initiative, and Sustainable Development into the Waste Management Program. Tad serves as an adjunct professor at Villanova University where he develops and is teaching graduate classes in principles of sustainable development, sustainable manufacturing, and eco-design and advanced life cycle assessment. He assisted Villanova with developing a Master of Science degree in sustainable engineering. In addition, Tad is an instructor at Villanova for the IFMA Sustainability Facility Professional Course, which is an assessment-based certificate program delivering a specialty credential in sustainability. Tad has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Drexel and an MS in Water Resources and Environmental Engineering from Villanova. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Pennsylvania, a lead accredited professional, a certified sustainability facility professional, and is trained as an ISO 14001 lead auditor. Tad is an active member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and the U.S. Green Building Council. And it's my pleasure to hand over the program to Tad. Thank you, Wayne. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I do want to thank uh, the PA Recy Recycling Market Center and the National Recycling Coalition for the opportunity to speak today. This is definitely uh, an area that's really uh, important to me and something that I've been involved with for many years. As Wayne mentioned in the introduction, I did work for the Environmental Protection Agency uh, for 10 years. And in that role as the waste minimization national expert, I worked with many different manufacturing facilities over those years to help them figure out ways to reduce their generation of waste and to improve their operations. Uh, during my time period there, it was, uh, you know, basically a time where we took a hard look at the waste management hierarchy and we basically determined that there was definitely more of a need to focus on opportunities to recover energy out of out of waste as much as possible and uh, a lot of activity occurred during that time period. Uh, also while I was there I did a lot of work with e-waste. Uh, back in the day uh, e-waste was becoming a big problem and there, there wasn't many uh, regulations or many much direction on how to manage that material. So at the time, we were really focused on you know, what could be done with e-waste. And we're actually working with the manufacturers like Dell and uh, different folks like that to figure out a more closed loop or uh, circular economy type, type of designs that they could implement. Uh, Wayne also mentioned that I'm a professor. I do teach at Villanova right now, but the first class I ever taught was in 1998 
at Temple University where I taught classes on solid and hazardous waste management. So today I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you about zero waste strategies for corporations. Is zero waste possible? You know, we all know there's a proliferation of landfill free claims in the market today. And the question I always ask when I see those claims is, you know, are these companies really achieving zero waste to landfill in a legitimate manner? Uh, if we think about it, as I, as I go through today, I really want to talk about our current system of waste management in North America and some of the considerations for companies and different organizations to think about as they strive to become landfill free or, you know, basically achieve zero waste to landfill. So I'll, I'll definitely be going through that as, as uh, I talk today and we will be taking questions at the end and I'm expecting uh, we've got a, a lot of people on the uh, webinar here today. So I'm expecting there will be some questions because this is an area that's not really well defined and uh, there is a lot of activity in, in the market right now. So I just uh, am basically showing a slide now of all the different companies that we've been able to identify. And, and this is just a very short list of companies that are claiming to be to have landfill free, free, uh, landfill free facilities. Uh, Subaru is probably the most prominent. Uh, if you all recall over the years, we've been seeing Subaru commercials on television talking about how they've basically had land free manufacturing facilities and Coming from the world of working at EPA as well as working in industry now for over 30 years, I know that going landfill free is not really easy. I mean, it's a very complex process to deal with. There's many, many different materials that have to be managed based on the type of manufacturing facility or, you know, any organization. And it's, it's, you know, you kind of wonder, are these claims accurate? Are they true? And a number of others have come out recently. Uh, Procter & Gamble recently announced that they've got 45 facilities that are landfill free. Unilever just announced that all their North American facilities are landfill free. Even the Philadelphia Eagles now are claiming that. And uh, they've done a lot of work, not only to reduce uh, waste uh, in their, you know, in the venue of uh, football games, but they've also done a really good job of educating a lot of different folks about waste and recycling and just general sustainability. So really good stuff happening in the world. And it is exciting for me to see that these organizations are making claims like this. I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call that are really well versed in waste. You know, I saw that there were a lot of some people signed up from different government agencies. There was a lot of uh, sustainability and waste management professionals on the phone. And, uh, you know, you have to realize that the list that I show here is not a comprehensive list. And if we were to draw a box and we look at total material flows in or in and out of any organization, these are some of the materials you're going to typically see coming out as waste. And we all know solid municipal waste, the, the trash that we all drag down to the end of our streets each week when we put our trash out. Uh, we're pretty familiar with that and the different components of that. But we also have to remember that there's also electronic wastes construction and demolition waste, packaging, organics, and that could be everything from food to landscaping and biomass, uh, lunchroom waste, you know, if, uh, depending on the organization, it could be a, uh, you know, a large cafeteria or even a grocery store that just generates a tremendous amount of uh, organic material. And then recyclables are all pretty straightforward, paper, plastics, cardboard. Uh, we do know that we are really limited by our recycling infrastructure as well as our waste management infrastructure within the United States and North America on how we can uh, handle certain materials. And also economics are going to drive the value of materials and how much they're recycled. One thing we also have to consider is hazardous materials and hazardous waste. Uh, having come from EPA, I know that you know many materials and, and waste are heavily regulated. Uh, pharmaceutical waste is another, another thing we have to consider. Also biomedical there are requirements for different uh, types of waste on how they're managed and whatnot. And it makes it a challenge when a company is basically making a claim of being landfill free or zero waste to landfill. And when I think about waste, it's really not waste to me. It's all about materials management. You know, it's really important for facilities to understand all the material flows in and out of a facility and what materials are ending up as waste. And I'm a firm believer in the fact that all facilities, organizations, manufacturers, hospitals, 
grocery stores, whatever we're talking about here, really need to actively work to reduce the waste at the source, eliminate the production of waste entirely, and then determine the least impactful methods to manage those materials. Whenever we look at materials flowing in or out of an organization, you know, we really try to understand, number one, can you eliminate uh, the generation of this in the first place, and then what can you do to improve the operation uh, and manage these materials in the most beneficial manner. So the question that I typically ask is when I see these various companies and organizations making landfill or zero waste claims, you know, what are the market drivers for them and why are they even doing this? And what we're finding is that you know many of the companies that make these claims are doing this because it's part of their sustainability program. Uh, some are doing it for cost savings. You know, I would say the majority of manufacturers are really focused on it for cost savings. I think it's also something that in the world of the many green claims we're seeing, you know, with sustainability initiatives and different claims that are coming out from various companies and organizations, it's something that the average person can easily understand. Oh, wow, this company's doing a great job. You know, they're not putting any waste into landfill. You know, I think that, like, when you see the Subaru commercial, obviously the people that are marketing, developing the marketing and the messaging there for that company, the advertisers, you know, they're really focused on trying to appeal to a certain group of people that would really connect with that. But it is something that the average person can easily understand and can develop some type of uh, maybe loyalty or interest in a company that they are making strides to do that. We also know that there are some supply chain requirements and then regulations, and I'm going to talk about each of these in a minute. And this is just an example on this slide. You can see here, this is an excerpt out of uh, a recent article from uh, about Procter & Gamble. And basically, you know, sending zero waste, zero consumer or manufacturing waste to landfills is one of Procter & Gamble's major sustainability goals. So, you know, that that's uh, evidence for sure that the sustainability program is driving them. And then we've all heard of this small company called Walmart, and uh, you know, very interesting that they have basically uh, three primary goals. One of them is to basically and, you know, create zero waste to landfill by 2025. So that's pretty pretty big for them. It's you know, giant organization, and you know, just think about the supply chain and the number of stores they have. In fact, when I was at EPA, we had started working with Walmart probably in the early 2000s before they really were on the sustainability uh, bandwagon and really you know, making major commitments like they do now. And we had learned then that they were one of the largest recyclers of uh, waste and had done a really great job of converting a lot of materials from landfill at the time. We were actually working with them to try to uh, help them push their suppliers to reduce waste, actually to reduce certain materials and chemicals that were being put into various products. So they had made some really great strides and uh, it's good to see that an organization like this, which is in everybody's lives, you know, whether, uh, you know, you see them on TV, you drive by one of their trucks, their stores are everywhere. Uh, they do have a lot of influence. So, so companies like this do have a big role in, in spreading the message of you know, improving the way we manage materials and the way we make our society more sustainable. The other thing that's really interesting, back in 2010, if you look here, uh, Walmart sent out a questionnaire of 15 questions to all their suppliers, roughly 100,000 of them, and they basically forced them to really think about sustainability and you know how they as an organization, the suppliers, were going to address certain issues. And you notice here questions one and two under material efficiency specifically ask questions about you know if they uh, measure and report the total amount of solid waste generated from their facilities and if they had set publicly available solid waste reduction targets. So you know, basically that was a huge uh, opportunity to raise awareness among suppliers that aren't in the United States. You know, a lot of products are made overseas with Walmart. So it's the supply chain is definitely having an influence on getting companies to be more uh, interested in this. And I also think consumers are starting to drive it as well. And, Really, I don't even like using that word because I don't feel like I'm a consumer, I'm a person, but you know, that's the uh, lingo we hear in the market quite often. Another big one is cost savings, and you know, my mantra has always been uh, waste equals lost profit, and if you're not putting 
the raw materials or everything you bring into your factory out in the product you're selling and you're basically losing money. And uh, we strongly endorse the use of source reduction techniques in manufacturing uh, you know, to find opportunities to eliminate waste uh, entirely. And I know for a fact, having worked in a lot of facilities over the years, that uh, a lot of materials going to landfill have significant value. Uh, a lot of times it's a product that could be sold and you know, basically uh, a lost revenue. And just the savings from the uh, disposal and tipping fees you know, uh, could be significant. I remember years ago working at a plant that made uh, insulation products and uh, they are they were paying over a million dollars a year just to disposal and tipping fees. So not a small sum. Another uh, thing that's driving the market is definitely regulations and uh, for liability reasons. Uh, having worked in EPA, I know that there was a lot of uh, companies that got uh, tied up and as potentially re responsible parties and super fund and different things like that. Uh, just recently, we were on the phone with a, a customer of ours who was very interested in getting certified for zero waste landfill or landfill diversion. And they told us a story how one of their management companies was uh, basically claiming they were recycling a bunch of the materials they were providing to them. And then they found out that this company was actually illegally dumping them in some wetlands. And uh, that company got busted and their name was all over the, the material. So it was not a good situation. Also, we know that legislation is driving elimination of electronic waste uh, from the waste stream. And you know that's trickling back to every person and every organization that they have to figure out what they're going to do with their uh, electronic materials. Uh, Pennsylvania just uh, passed a disposal ban in January 2013. That's my home state, so that's why I highlight that. But there's also 25 other states that have legislation mandating statewide e-waste recycling. So the next thing I really want to talk about is with this pro proliferation of organizations making claims about being landfill free or zero waste landfill, you know, how are they doing that? How are they making those claims? Are they all following a similar standard? And I can tell you that there currently is no existing national standards on waste to landfill reductions or zero waste to landfill at this time. Uh, and I'm, you know, being a, from a company that does auditing and certification work, I want nothing more than to see some type of a standard because uh, I have a, you know, we really dislike when people greenwash. <laughs> There's a lot of greenwashing going out on in the marketplace right now. So it's important that standards get developed and that people follow them. Uh, I can tell you right now some of the current activity, ASTM International, E60 Group on Sustainability, our company is actually involved with that. And uh, that group was formed in 2008. And uh, they are working actively to develop sustainability standards that are going to be published and recognized internationally. Uh, currently in progress is something we're working actively on. Uh, we're focused on, uh, number one, defining what is waste generated at manufacturing facilities and also uh, developing standards around uh, claims around waste diversion from, from these manufacturing facilities. I also know that there's some activity right now with American National Standards Institute, ANSI, and they are in process of developing a waste diversion and fill through standard. I, I know the folks from... Uh, Zero Waste International Alliance are involved with that and uh, others, and we're actively uh, pursuing an opportunity to get involved with that also. Uh, I'd like to bring our background to the table here and, and really help drive this in a manner. And in a few minutes, you're going to see that landfill free is not really cut and dry and straightforward, and you know, every organization is going to be different. So having a standard that works for all is going to be really important. Uh, there's uh, the current activity that we're involved with. I did mention the ASTME 60 committee and Green Circle certified right now. You know, we are providing third party analysis and certification of waste diversion from landfill, uh, you know, for claims for landfill free, serving on that ASTME 60 committee that I mentioned, as well as uh, we're now a founding member of the Sustainable Purchasing Council. And that I'm, I'm really excited about that organization because uh, they're working uh, with number of organizations, uh, both uh, large purchasers, manufacturers, government organizations, as well as getting connected with uh, folks like the Sustainability Consortium to develop standards around what 
is and what is not a sustainable product or service. So um, we're going to basically be working over the next, you know, probably year or two here to develop some specific standards around that and a system of measuring and identifying sustainable products and services. So com companies with large purchasing departments or organizations like GSA can definitely uh, understand, you know, what is and what is not a sustainable product. I also really want to recognize the work of the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council and Zero Waste International Alliance. Uh, they've done some great work on developing zero waste definitions and principles for zero waste for businesses and communities. And this uh, information you see right here, they just rolled out earlier this year. Uh, you can, we're going to be talking a lot about the waste management hierarchy. And I do want to give these guys credit because they're really pushing the envelope on, you know, trying to change the whole concept of waste and really working in a direction to go well beyond our current system of waste management, materials management, you know, bringing to the forefront the need for source reduction, redesign of products, uh, you know, more sustainable design and uh, different things like that. So, you know, definitely uh, important to follow them and I'm looking forward to working with them as we move forward on developing more national standards. So the message I want to leave with all of you is there is a need for a comprehensive national standard uh, that clearly defines how companies should measure and report zero waste to landfill claims. It's also important that, in my opinion, that uh, whatever standards developed requires some type of third party validation and certification. Uh, there, a lot of companies make or self certify or make their own claims. And over the years, I've you know definitely looked into a lot of those claims and a lot of times they're inaccurate or they make mistakes, they misinterpret different standards. So by having third parties evaluate and basically determine uh, if these things are being done properly is really important. So let's talk about over the next few minutes now some material management strategies and definitely considerations for making landfill free claims. And uh, this is an area, like I said, very complex. Um, you have to think about, draw a box around every facility and look at all the material flows, what goes in, what comes out, and uh, how can things be done better. And uh, these are actually what I consider acceptable means of diversion. And when you know, Green Circle certified, this is something that we focus on in our current waste diversion analysis. As you see here on the right, this is the waste management hierarchy as published by the Environmental Protection Agency. And obviously, you know, this is the direction to go, source reduction and reuse, recycling and composting, energy recovery, treatment and disposal, very last. It's totally unfortunate that this pyramid is actually in reverse uh, in our society right now. And there's still a tremendous amount of valuable materials that end up in landfills that are burned, you know, different things like that. So uh, I'm, I'm really very focused on looking at organizations when we do our analysis of their um, waste and materials management and focused on, you know, really pushing source reduction, uh, looking at opportunities for reuse or redesigning uh, products or processes to eliminate waste, processing and selling to third parties, you know, maybe reusing the same or different process. Some of the companies we work with actually take materials that are generated in one facility and they become a raw material in another facility. So they're able to eliminate uh, that as a waste. Composting. Definitely some great benefits there for organics management and aerobic digestion. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, we are, we do have the ability as a society, the way we're set up right now, to uh, basically turn our wastewater treatment plants and our existing landfills into uh, energy factories. You know, we can basically uh, collect methane out of those processes and convert that over to some you know, either energy or raw materials or fuel for trucks. So important things to consider. And then waste to energy. Uh, definitely, I look at that as a opportunity for minimizing waste to landfill. But I do qualify that, that the materials that go to waste to energy should either be, you know, materials that aren't easily recyclable within the infrastructure that exists today or are not economically recoverable materials. Uh, definitely uh, think that Waste energy has great value, uh, but I don't, uh, you know, really support incineration or landfilling of any type. So very, very complex things that we have to look at as we consider uh, every different organization. 
here's some graphics that are off the EPA website. Uh, this it's a bit dated. It's about three years old, but that's typical of EPA. They typically take you know two to three years to get new information out. But you can see here that U.S. municipal solid waste landfill volumes have declined uh, and are declining over time as we see more opportunities happening within the world of recycling, as you can see here in the green, uh, waste to energy, and then also composting are increasing. Uh, we still generate a lot of waste in this country, and it's kind of sad, but the fact that we are seeing more diversion, that's really great. So if we look at 2010 data, you know, we're roughly looking about uh, that municipal solid waste has fallen to 54%. Uh, which is down from 70% in 1990. And another interesting thing is our recycling rate across the United States is only at 34%. So there's still huge opportunity. You know, even if you think about some particular waste streams like plastic uh, water bottles or soda bottles, billions of them generated, but only 28% recycling rate for PET. Uh, I know there's a lot of initiatives underway, you know, with the various bottling companies and you know, whatnot, but Still tons of room for uh, improvement there. So when we talk about source reduction, I just want to make sure we're all clear. Source reduction is basically eliminating waste at the source. Uh, no, don't even generate the waste in the first place. And that comes through various means. It could be through uh, engineering design, product design. It could be through preventative maintenance, you know, uh, good housekeeping practices, various different methods to do that. And when we think about it, you know, it's definitely through increased efficiency and use of raw materials. Uh, we recently were at a facility uh, doing a waste analysis for them, and they were basically disposing of about 8% of the raw materials that came into the plant as scrap. And uh, that represented roughly $6 million worth of product, worth of raw material value. It didn't even include the value of the product. So, you know, even today, there's there's still a lot of inefficiency out there and a lot of room for improvement with these different organizations. Packaging is another big one. We're starting to see a lot of movement among uh, different organizations on reducing packaging. You know, so so definitely good movement in that in that area. Another important area is organics management. It's a large piece of the pie when we think about the amount of materials going to landfill uh, or for disposal, and. The EPA actually has this uh, new program out on the EPA Food Recovery Challenge and a lot of activity around that. The agency does a great job. You know, you, they usually pick areas of importance and they focus on. Back when I was at the agency, we were focused on persistent bicumulative and toxic chemicals and waste, and, you know, really drive, trying to drive those down. And now there's a major initiative on organics. And the great thing about the food hierarchy is, you know, more, you know, it really definitely looks at the most preferred to least preferred as we typically see, but through source reduction, feeding hungry people, feeding animals, using uh, food products for industrial material or industrial uses, or composting with landfill and incineration at the very bottom, you know, it gives a lot of choices for somebody who's managing organics. And there's a lot of things to consider. You know, it's not just the food that's lost, but it's also all the costs. If you think about a typical restaurant or even a grocery store, the amount of materials that they bring into that facility that they paid for that ended up going out and you know being uh, coming a waste uh, there's a lot of value to that same thing with the cost of labor you know if it, especially for food preparation or a grocery store that has people that are managing the produce section uh, the cost of the disposal of the discarded food taking up landfill space contributing to greenhouse gases a lot of things that must be considered in organics uh, we've been to quite a few composting facilities now. It's you know this continues to grow. The infrastructure is getting much better for organics management, uh, and you know great way to manage organics. Uh, a lot of people are anti uh, composting though, especially if they live close by. If you've ever ever been to a composting facility, the odor coming out of them can be pretty serious if they're not managed well. But one thing we have to think about, you know, when a company is making the zero waste landfill claim and they are using organics management of, you know, whether it's composting or anaerobic digestion or whatever, what about all the contaminants? I can guarantee that, you know, we all know that people basically don't put all the things in the right bins when you're doing composting or you're doing food collection at a facility. And, you know, you're going to have plastics in there and other things that can't be composted. So you got to ask the question, what does that comp composting facility do with that material? You know, are they putting it in a landfill? Are they throwing that into going to waste energy? 
and uh, you also have to think about what are the boundaries. You know, where does when a company makes a zero waste landfill claim, where does their responsibility stop? Is it when the hauler or the management company takes it away, or do we have to follow it all through the waste stream? Different things to consider. I mentioned earlier the EPA Food Recovery Challenge, and you can see there's a lot of organizations that are involved in that. Again, that's really good for raising awareness and driving uh, reductions of organic materials, especially in large venues like with the Philadelphia Eagles um, or you know Unilever, different groups like that, Harvard University, all have committed to doing things like this. Another, I mentioned earlier, anaerobic digestion. Uh, I think wastewater treatment plants, having worked in them quite a few times, uh, Always good opportunity there for managing sludge and reducing the, the volumes of sludge, but food waste and other organics can also be put into anaerobic digestion. Uh, we, years ago, we did work at a pharmaceutical facility that generated a significant amount of organics, and we actively worked with them while we were at EPA uh, to come up with solutions to turn that material into uh, fuel, you know, some type of energy source, and then basically uh, use the the solids that were left over for um, agricultural uses. And, you know, a lot of uh, opportunities in this realm, you know, we can create electricity, we can use it as fuel for a uh, fuel for trucks. I know there's a lot of initiatives with uh, several of the big waste management companies now that are collecting landfill gas and basically using that to fuel uh, their, their vehicles. Uh, I know Procter & Gamble just recently went off um, purchasing fossil fuels because they're in the Marcellus Shale up in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania and they're basically fueling all their trucks there with natural gas. Um, we also have the opportunity to use these materials for chemical additives or as feedstock for different products. Recycling material reuse, excellent process, getting more developed, national recycling rate in the 30 percentile range. Uh, definitely great things happening and Again, heavily driven by economics and the markets, uh, waste recovery and reuse and manufacturing, a big, big opportunity, a lot of things going on there. I'm really a firm believer in the need for us as a society to develop a circular economy for all materials and products. They all have value. And, you know, recycling is good uh, as long as products can be recycled back into themselves. But we still don't have, have not perfected that in any way, and there's still a lot of room there. Another question, you know, for people that are claiming zero or landfill free, what about the contaminants in the re like in the recycling stream? How are they managed? Uh, I can guarantee for all of you that are on the phone that are in the, the waste management industry or even in the uh, regulatory industry, uh, you go to any MRF or any recycling facility and there's guaranteed to be uh, materials that are not recyclable, you know, mixed plastics that don't aren't easily recyclable, anything, you know, uh, beyond the ones and twos that are easily and usually collected, you know, how are they managed? Are they basically going to landfill? Again, where does the boundary start or stop for the response, the generator? And I think it's really important also to seriously look at the management companies. You know, if someone's making a landfill free claim, I think it's important to audit and verify that the management companies are really doing what they say they're doing with the products. I, I mentioned that example earlier uh, where this uh, particular organization is now going to deal with cleaning up a mess of somebody that was, you know, they trusted and was not doing what they said they were supposed to do. So let's talk briefly now about electronics. Uh, every organization, I don't care if it's your, your home uh, or a large manufacturing facility, office building, whatever, electronics are going to be something that are prolific in our society right now. Uh, think about how many phones you've gone through uh, over the last few years. And, you know, this uh, picture here basically illustrates the evolution of the cell phones. <laughs> and we're at a point now where we went from those really ugly giant handheld or old bad car phones only a few years ago, it seems like, to the point now where you've got something right out of the Jetsons where you can basically talk to your uh, kids on, you know, FaceTime or you can text and get your email and check the weather and stocks. So really great technology advances, but it's also created a huge, huge issue. And we do know that e-waste is a problem because of rapid technology advancements, like I just illustrated, increasing consumer purchases. If you think about it, you know, we're all part of a, uh, the 
affluent middle class right now. But in developing countries, there's another 3 billion people that all want to live like us. And you have to really ask the question, how do we give iPhones, iPods, laptops, you know, to another 3 billion people? So EWH definitely fast, fast growing, uh, being banned from landfills. And e-waste management is really difficult. I can tell you, uh, it's, they're very complex materials to manage. They're not easily recyclable. Uh, I talk in my classes when I teach about advanced uh, life cycle assessment and you know sustainable product design. We talk about all the time how these electronics aren't designed for disassembly or improvement. There's several companies out there that manage electronics that have landfill-free claims and you really got to take a hard look at that because I can tell you with all the mixed materials and plastics that they have to manage, how are they managing them? I see this industry as gigantic opportunity for not only sustainable product design, but the circular economy for this sector. Um, there's very valuable uh, raw materials in these phones and computers, tantalum, niobium, different things like that that are rare earth elements that are limited supply. And they're basically being wasted and, you know, mixed and not easily recoverable. Waste to energy, uh, we do know that this is the conversion of non, again, my definition, non-recyclable, not economically recoverable materials into heat, electricity, or fuel using various processes. You've got to ask the question, though, uh, we, you know, if you look at the laws of thermodynamics, there is no way. So we can convert waste to a smaller volume, but we still have ash to manage. And how is it managed? You've got to ask that question when you're evaluating these zero waste and landfill free claims. Uh, there are a number of companies now that are developing waste from fuel or fuels from waste, excuse me. Um, and basically what they're doing is taking uh, these materials, pelletizing them, and then turning them into materials that can basically go into a waste to energy facility or can be burned in an industrial boiler or it can be used as a replacement for coal. I think that's really excellent and you know, we're seeing some great advances there. But again, another question, are these typically non-recyclable and not economically recoverable materials? If we're gonna to go to a circular economy, we wanna only be burning stuff that we really can't recover at this point in time until we develop better technology and a better system to manage. And when we look at different management options. If you remember the waste hierarchy, as you go down, waste to energy is just above landfill. And there's some reasons for that. Uh, first of all, waste to energy allows for recovery of energy value of the web, of the, all the waste, as well as any metals or materials that don't get combusted. Uh, visited quite a few waste to energy plants. And, you know, it's great to see when these materials are being burned and electricity is coming out the back end of the plant, but it's still, uh, you know, not the best use of, of raw materials and resources. Uh, based on LCA data, uh, there are less greenhouse gases than landfilling, especially when you consider the fact that uh, waste and, or uh, landfills create methane over time. And if that methane is not properly managed, methane has 21 times the global warming potential of uh, CO2. So you can see, you know, there's there's definitely things to consider. Uh, big reductions in waste volume, uh, 80 to 90 percent with waste to energy. However, if you look at a landfill, roughly 100% of all that, all those resources are being stored for the long term. And again, there is no way because they don't really break down or, you know, very little decomposition. And then you can also look at uh, ash coming out of the waste energy. I, I mentioned earlier, what about that? What happens to it? Several, uh, quite a few states basically regulate that ash as an alternate daily cover. So it's able to be used on existing landfills. Uh, basically as a replacement for topsoil but you know again something to consider and evaluate in every analysis and you know typical landfills are using topsoil and other things and uh, one one reason we started this waste diversion certification with the green circle is there were so many organizations out there that were taking materials that we saw and basically grinding them up and turning them into other sources of alternate daily cover uh, the c and d waste construction and demolition waste uh, people are very good at that. In fact, if you look at the lead standards, um, many people are seeking to earn lead points for reducing construction and demolition waste, whereas a lot of the management companies were taking that material and grinding it up and making alternate daily covers, so they're landfilling it anyway, and they're just using some loopholes and definitions to basically claim landfill free. 
the big question comes up when we get into hazardous and other wastes. Uh, how are these wastes managed? You know, big questions. You know, are they typically accounted for in the landfill free claim? If you uh, look at what PNG and Unilever are putting out, they basically do say that they work to eliminate those materials, you know, and, and integrate those into their landfill free claims. However, they if there are regulations that require the disposal of these materials by a landfill, then they, they will basically uh, not count that. And they do, if you look here at Procter & Gamble, they do have some limits on how much material, if it is a regulated material, uh, can contribute to their landfill free claim. And if they go over this uh, uh, greater than uh, 1,000 kilograms per year, then they basically don't allow the landfill free claim. Unilever publicly states that they do not include uh, hazardous or not hazardous waste within their uh, accounting for their landfill free claims and they are very public about it. So to me, both of these organizations are being very transparent or they're, they're at least telling you how they've made the determination since there are no standards to follow. And uh, these are the kind of things you have to look, look at and, and ask questions about You know, when you hear these different folks claiming this. You, you kind of wonder about like Subaru and some of the others that have made the claims. You know, are they, how are they managing their hazardous waste? So uh, I'm getting near the end here. We'll be taking questions shortly, but I really want to point out again the importance of verification and auditing, auditing of diversion of waste from landfill. Uh, there is a major need to validate and audit companies' claims to divert waste materials because, again, uh, very complex. Not every organization is the same. It's really hard uh, you know, to just kind of lump all these people into one size fits all. And you have to follow the materials. I mean, is the management company really diverting all materials? When we do our analysis for a, a waste free or we, uh, waste diversion or landfill free claim, we not only audit the company and understand their materials and their flows, we also audit at their uh, management companies and determine what's happening to that material. And we will ask the hard questions. All right, what are you doing with the contaminants in the composting facility? What are you doing with the contaminants in recycling? How do you manage your ash and waste energy? So all good stuff. Uh, there is definitely value to third-party certifications. Uh, many of you may have heard that the Federal Trade Commission now has uh, just updated their green guides in late 2012. And I'm really excited about that because for years we've all been exposed to greenwashing and lies by many manufacturers and different organizations that bend the truth and they basically put the spin on various things. Uh, you've all heard of things that are environmentally friendly or you know, good for the environment. You know, you've seen those kind of claims and those are very nebulous. So the green guides really have established strict requirements and enforcement guidelines for environmental product claims. Uh, FTC is definitely stepping up enforcement. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission at this time does not have any specific green guides or requirements around landfill free claims, but I can imagine based on the prol proliferation of these that we will see uh, that being captured in future, future analysis by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, recently, Amazon, Macy's, Sears just had a, uh, a major issue with the Federal Trade Commission over a claim that they were selling clothing or socks made out of bamboo and they were really made out of rayon and they all paid a fine of about $1.2 million each for making those false claims. So that's just an example of what's happening in the market. And part of our work uh, with Green Circle is to really try to minimize the, the risk for companies, uh, you know, with FTC now enforcing things. Another important aspect is, you know, consumers, actually people who buy things are really interested in, learning more about the sustainability of the products and the companies. And based on this uh, recent research by Cone, I actually was just out at the Sustainable Brands Conference out in San Diego, and uh, Cone had some updated data, but roughly 54% of respondents believe eco-labels are effective in helping bring changes to environmental social problems. So the work of folks like the Zero Waste uh, Alliance, uh, you know, definitely redefining what is waste and basically trying to change the management system here in the United States, excellent. Uh, but also we have to look at what's going on with uh, consumers in their trust of eco labels. And based on this analysis, uh, roughly 44% of consumers do have a higher level of trust in brands that use eco labels that aren't, you know, companies that aren't doing self-proclaimed 
uh, certifications is really important. So when we think about the value of third-party certification, trans transparency, huge, a uh, lot of activity around that right now. A rigorous, a rigorous evaluation process is really important uh, to ensure organization claims are valid based on the latest standards or industry practices. Uh, third-party certification also provides independent third-party verification that the claim is factual and accurate. Uh, most of the companies that do hire us to do their analysis and certification want to make sure that they're not misinterpreting things and you know, they are want a third party to evaluate their system. And that really reduces risk for future FTC enforcement as well as accusations of greenwashing. We are in a world now where uh, with the internet age and the ability for people to communicate really easily, uh, someone can easily be offended by something a company does and that could go out on Twitter, Facebook, out on the internet and be spread like wildfire and a company's brand and reputation can be damaged really quickly. So, um, you know, the consumers are getting a lot smarter. People, the young, the young folks, the millennials right now, really smart. A lot of them are really into sustainability and, and looking for companies that support that. So this is just a little bit about the waste diversion certification. Uh, with this, like I said, with this increasing demand, Green Circle has developed a certification for not only zero waste to landfill, but we do evaluate uh, diversion rates. So if a company has uh, basically not achieved zero, but they do have a percentage they've diverted from landfill, we will evaluate and certify that. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out, since I have a big audience here, I just wanted to announce that uh, the Sustainable Biodiesel uh, Alliance has just basically uh, developed a standard and uh, we were actually selected by them to be their third party certifier and auditor for this new certification system that they've de developed for biodiesel and uh, if you think about it there are a lot of waste materials that are converted into uh, fuel and uh, waste oils uh, waste oils greases fats coming out of wastewater plants all those can be converted into biodiesel and this was actually just announced uh, a week ago up in New York City at an event with Willie Nelson, who is an honorary board member of the SBA. And we are in the pilot process right now, and uh, we're going to be certifying, running through pilot on several certs uh, with some producers, uh, end users, and distributors of biodiesel to test the system. And uh, again, uh, since I have a great audience here of people that are interested in this, I just want to announce it and let people know that it is available. And if anyone would be interested, if you're using biodiesel in your fleets or, you know, you have uh, an interest in this, just, you know, you can reach out to the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance or Green Circle to get more information. So with that, Wayne, I think we're at a point where we can start to take questions. Uh, I covered a lot of material here. It looks like uh, we've got about uh, 25 minutes or so for questions. So uh, see, you know, if you wanted to uh, let me know what questions are, I'll be glad to address them. Okay, thank you, Todd. Excellent presentation, very comprehensive. We're now going to field some questions from our uh, for our presenter. Again, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Go to Webinar dialog box. And we do have a few on already. And I'll start with the first one here. Uh, where does UL Environment Zero Waste Standard fit into this discussion? Well, UL Environment is another certification body that's uh, developed a standard and. Uh, they are in process right now of, you know, working to get ANSI verification of that standard. Uh, again, any kind of ANSI process needs to be open to many stakeholders and get a lot of input. And um, it's kind of, there hasn't been much publicized on that. Um, I know I've talked to uh, several individuals that are involved in that. And I think it is important that that process be opened up publicly and get more input from folks that are in this field and have the expertise really consider this because as you all saw this is a very complex matter so yeah ULE definitely out there working on that and um, you know I def that our goal within Green Circle you know we've been working on the ASTM E60 committee to help develop develop standards um, we're very interested in being involved in that ANSI process along with organizations like ULE okay next question is do you know if the EPA will be coming out with a definition of zero waste soon they solicited input in 2011 on their MSW characterization study and got the most comments from the public suggesting that they adopt the ZWIA definition of zero waste to end the confusion in the marketplace. Well, 
uh, from my discussions with the people I know in the Office of Solid Waste, uh, anything within that agency takes a long time. And uh, my understanding is that is being evaluated, and that's the answer they typically give. Uh, but I do not know this, the status of where they are with that at that point. Uh, definitely be interested in reaching out to some of my uh, contacts there and uh, determine where that's going. Given that technologies continue to evolve, what is a non-recyclable today may be reused, recycled, composted, digested, or redesigned in the future? So should we not commit to long-term put-or-pay contracts to feed waste-to-energy facilities? Um, well, I don't know that that's, I mean, that's a pretty complex issue in itself. And, you know, I know technology is rapidly changing, but if you look at the fact that uh, a lot of, you know, we have an infrastructure that's established in the United States. Uh, we still have a lot of materials that are not manageable in that infrastructure or not uh, driven by economics. So I, I don't, I wouldn't say that there's a need to end those contracts at this point. I think what we have to do is work within the system that we have and drive change uh, as technology allows and at the pace of industry. Also, I think that you know various folks within uh, manufacturing op organizations, you're going you're to see more of this coming down from companies like Procter & Gamble or Unilever that are really committed to this and have these major commitments where uh, you know I think you're going to see these things being driven. Uh, when it comes to the masses, you know, the municipal solid waste coming out of residential, uh, again, there's a challenge there, a huge, huge need to educate people, really a major need to change the system because people aren't going to really change their habits unless they're forced. That's an unfortunate fact. So, uh, again, I don't really have a, a clear answer on that, but I, I think it's part of the discussion as we develop national standards and we develop uh, redesign our system. Do you know of any other organizations doing third-party certification of landfill free and zero waste claims? Yeah, I, I do believe that the uh, folks at um, Zero Waste are doing some of that. They're, they actually have certified a few facilities. Uh, I think they were uh, they were uh, Whole Foods markets. I know NSF has just offered a rolled out their certification. So there's a few organizations out there. They're all relatively new. Uh, I know that ours rolled out in March. Uh, it took us about a year to develop, you know, do the research and develop how we wanted to approach this. And uh, again, I think there is a need. We, we don't want to have everybody developing their own thing. I think it's there's a need to develop a national standard that is recognized by a multi-stakeholder group. This attendee has... Uh concern about textiles and why they are not uh, in, taken into consideration when talking about recyclable materials? Yeah, well, I, like I said, I made my list there of typical waste and textiles are really significant concern. I mean, just think, look in your own closet when you go home of all the clothing you have or your family has and think about those materials. And there really isn't a, a great infrastructure for recycling them. I think the best thing that people are doing is goodwill and you know reuse and sending them off to third world countries, and developing countries where they're needed. Uh, but it is it is something that's important. Uh, my focus today was mainly thinking about manufacturing, but you know even manufacturing facilities are going to have cloth and rags and different things that come out. So again, a lot of those end up going to laundries and recycling. So those are some alternatives there. But it is an issue, and, and uh, if you do a life cycle assessment of just cotton, I mean, the impacts of growing cotton and making clothing out of cotton are very large. They're up there in the realm of virgin aluminum. So uh, important to consider that. And, and again, I, I couldn't be, you know, didn't cover every waste stream, but everything has to be considered. U.S. Zero Waste Business Council is also developing a zero waste standard between this, yours, and the UL. How do we know which one will be the best for us slash clients? Um, well, I think what we need is a standard that's, you know, basically recognized by ANSI or ASTM or ISO. And, uh, you know, just like, you know, we all follow the ISO standards right now. Those are really well developed. Uh, there's a lot of great American national standards out there, ASTM standards. Uh, it will be hard to say, and I think we'll have to see how this evolves. 
And uh, again, getting in the right stakeholder group to develop those standards is going to be really important. Opening it up in a transparent manner for the development of the standards so there's proper public input and also a diverse group of people evaluating them will be the key to developing the best standard. Do the ANSI or ASTM standards include guidance about density factors to use to convert from waste volumes to weights in the cases where companies only have service level data? Well, that's a big problem, I'm going to tell you right now, because not every company is uh, doing that the same way. Uh, if we look at, for example, a single stream container of recyclables, you know, some companies might put that at, uh, say, 75 pounds per ton per yard, whereas others say it's only 30 or 40. You know, it's going to depend on the volumes. If you look at any single stream recycling container, there's usually a lot of cardboard, there's a lot of air, and it's really hard to say. But I do think there is a need for that because um, if until the industry, and I've been talking to the folks in these, uh, in these waste management facilities and organizations for years about the need to actively be able to measure every load that they pick up. Uh, I know they've a lot of them are working on it, but till we can get real data, there's going to be a lot of estimating. And you know, even even if you look at like carbon footprinting, you know, there's there's carbon factors that are used and recognized by EPA and other industry. I think there is going to be a need for volume conversion numbers, uh, especially when there's no way to effectively weigh every load or estimate it in a proper way. In fact, when we do our analysis, we we look at that closely because, you know, we've seen some companies that skew the numbers to make the diversion rates higher. Uh, the management companies do, and they'll use really high numbers for those single stream containers and things. And uh, to us, that's unacceptable. As we wait for a national standard, what are the first steps that a company should take to move down the path to zero waste? Well, I would say, you know, like I said earlier, I mean, you really need to look at material flows in the facility, really understand those flows, and then work towards reducing them at the source, redesigning, eliminating waste as much as possible, and then taking a hard look at the materials that you can't effectively do that to at this point. You know, maybe you're limited by technology or, uh, you know, different things like that. So I think it's important to evaluate your operation, understand the, the materials, and then get educated on the management methods that you can utilize. Uh, you know, there there are going to be organizations that, you know, basically their best choice beyond landfill is going to go to waste energy, regardless of what they have. And, you know, it's important to recognize that, and you know, that's that's one thing you have to think about that not all facilities are created equal. So, I think really inventorying, understanding, and then looking at what is available out there. There there are some really good landfill free uh, waste management companies out there. Uh, you know, the waste energy folks have done some good work over the years. Uh, so you really got to look at all your options and, and really try to find the best and most reputable management companies to work with is really important. Your statement about major businesses driving zero waste, uh, one of the drivers for them is that they want consumers to view them as acting in a sustainable manner. So won't it be important to have environmental organizations support whatever standards are developed to ensure they are not greenwashing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, even even that I mentioned earlier that uh, standard that was developed for sustainable biodiesel. I mean, they had 45, 50 different people develop the baseline practices for that. That included NGOs, uh, you know, uh, NRDC, different folks like that. So really important to have them involved and that's why I'm saying that any ANSI development process has to be open with uh, you know, a lot of stakeholder input among diverse groups. This question is concerning composting. Are there big differences between the states as far as compost licensing and regulations? Uh, I can't proclaim to be an expert on that. It's, it's a very, the infrastructure is really being developed. So um, without doing some research, I, I can't effectively answer that. But I do know there, you know, for example, uh, in Delaware, like in the Philadelphia area right now, Delaware has tends to be very friendly to composting. They've got some great facilities down there. I know there's been some small operations developing around the Philadelphia area, and some of them had some major issues. So uh, every state will be different, and uh, you know we, we do realize. When you look at organics, I mean, if you look at a natural system like a forest 
you know, basically all the materials that come out of a forest are basically composted, broken down, you know, converted back into food. And that's really what we need to do with our organics. It's, it's a huge issue and we need to really push for more infrastructure. So I'm hopeful that EPA and the states can come together and really come up with a good solution for this. And, and the waste management companies, you know, the, the folks that are dealing with these materials, you know, they have a big role in this as well. Okay, I think that's all the questions, and we're actually just about out of time. So, again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made available as a YouTube video. Links to these videos can be found on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Uh, Tad, thank you for that excellent presentation, and, and thank you, audience, for joining us. We hope you will enjoy us, join us next month for our webinar scheduled on Tuesday, July 16th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And have a great day. All right. Thank you.